Now, before we close things out tonight with our business pitch finale and our awards ceremony, we've got one final speaker coming to the stage. Now, he's had an incredible career journey from founding the Netherlands' first direct service internet provider in the 90s to national radio presenting to helping develop the award-winning cybercrime challenges. Now, he is a digital crime officer at Interpol's Global Complex for Innovation in Singapore, and he's here tonight to share with us about more of their work and how they're partnering with tech companies to fight advanced cybercrime. So I ask that you all dig really deep, give me as much energy as you possibly can to join me in welcoming Rulan Van Zeist. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Eetsma uh, akelijk daar. Um, it's nice to be back in, uh, in uh, Utrecht, Utrecht Mestatsien. Uh, I actually uh, studied uh, at the uh, Hogeschool van Utrecht and uh, Utrecht University, so if there's guys from those clubs. All right. Uh, currently, um, officially, I work at the National High Tech Crime Unit of the, of the Netherlands, uh, where I'm stationed in Driebergen, which is at least part of the province. But uh, they seconded me, gedetacheerd, to Singapore, where I live behind uh, this building that I'm going to introduce to you today. Every day, police worldwide must address new threats in international crime and work together to make the world safer. Interpol has strengthened its global reach with a new presence in Asia, complementing the General Secretariat in France and its regional offices across the world. In this way, the organization can better represent and serve the 190 countries that form its global membership. Located in Singapore, the Interpol Global Complex for Innovation, IGCI, is a research and development facility equipped with the latest tools and technology to combat international crime. The state-of-the-art building houses a command and coordination center, training spaces, and high-tech digital laboratories. Crime in the digital age has become more aggressive and more elusive. But technology has also opened up immense new opportunities for police, such as instant access to criminal data. Innovation in technology is our best ally. Through innovation, partnerships and the practical application of research, the IGCI will help member countries better cope with advanced crime threats. The IGCI has three main components. Firstly, it provides digital expertise and operational support in transnational cybercrime investigations. One of its iconic facilities is the Cyber Fusion Center, which provides real-time monitoring and analysis of threats within cyberspace. It can deploy digital forensic support teams to assist investigators in the field. The complex also hosts a 24-7 Command and Coordination Center, CCC, connected to the CCCs in Lyon, France, Buenos Aires, Argentina. This is the point of contact for any member country seeking urgent police information or facing a crisis situation. The second component is strategy and research to address today's cyber challenges. The IGCI provides a voice for global law enforcement in internet governance forums. Fighting cybercrime demands close collaboration between police, research centers, academia, and the public and private sectors. The third component is capacity building and training for law enforcement officers. The IGCI provides training online and in the field, and innovative research-based cyber training courses. With innovation, research and technology on our side, Interpol will remain at the forefront of the fight against transnational crime. And we also have a website <laughs> where you can find, my, find more information. Uh, so b before uh, we're going to delve into uh, what exactly we do with the private industry, let me explain a little bit about what Interpol is, because I know you've maybe seen movies where guys from Interpol are jumping out of helicopters. Unfortunately, we don't really do that. <laughs> We're not that cool. Um, we are a, a, an international organization that is funded by the uh, law enforcement agencies of basically all the countries in the world. So these are uh, 
basically our member countries. These are all the flags of all the countries in the world. Uh, there's one country that doesn't really want to be a member. Can you guess which one it is? That's North Korea. Yes, you get the prize. Yes, good for you. Um, okay, so, so they don't want to play along, but the rest of the world, they actually, uh, they actually do. Um, the, uh, it's, wow, there's a lot of enthusiasm going on uh, over there. <laughs> okay, so uh, Interpol is funded by uh, those, those countries um, paying basically membership fees. And you can pay a little bit extra, like the Netherlands actually does. Uh, so the Netherlands is uh, one of the top 10 contributors to Interpol by paying about 1 million uh, per year, uh, donating that to the organization to make it, to make it work. Uh, we, we're looking into other funding models. We tried this for a while, but it wasn't really popular. Uh, so, you know, of course, if you ever get one of those on your screen, just call the police and, and I don't know, reset your hard drive or something. Uh, so that's not us, obviously. Um, and it, I make, I'll make it even worse, uh, because we could not even do this based on any law, because we are actually not cops. We're not. Uh, which, which might be confusing because, uh, well, I'm a, a Hoofd Inspector at the National High Tech Crime Unit, uh, but when I'm seconded to Interpol, I'm just, you know, one of the, one of the many people that work at Interpol and I cannot, I can geen parkeerticket uitdelen at this moment. Um, about one third of our, uh, our people that, that work uh, at Interpol, about one third of the staff, our people are seconded from their national law enforcement agency. Um, but of course, there's other staff. Uh, about two thirds of our staff are people who are hired directly by Interpol. And those are not just the secretaries and maybe the IT guys. Actually, some of the digital crime officers and the, the researchers are hired directly by Interpol, basically by the, the budget that I mentioned before. Um, if you would be interested in becoming a digital crime officer or a cyber researcher at the Interpol Global Complex for Innovation, and actually at the moment we have a vacancy open, it closes in a few days' time, and if you visit our website www.interpol.int, uh, you'll find more details there. Now there's one other way of staffing that we have at Interpol, um, which might sound a bit odd because I already said we have one-third cops, two-thirds uh, staff that we hire directly. We also have a few people who are uh, kind of um, seconded to us from their company. And in, um, in Singapore, actually, we have a few strategic partners. These companies uh, have seconded people directly to our organization. And we're working with them. And they can use their back office when they provide information and, and analysis to Interpol. So, Crime. Obviously, Interpol is an, it's the international criminal police organization. Um, what type of crimes do we deal with? Basically, it's been defined as ordinary law crime. And that's not a very, very clear legal definition, but it means that it is the type of crime that basically everybody in the world agrees that this is a serious crime. It also tends to be an organized type of crime. So there's some crimes that some odd countries might have uh, that are very specific to, to their culture, then Interpol will probably not get involved. But if it looks something like this, then, uh, yeah. <laughs> It could probably be uh, an Interpol uh, situation, might be, if it's an international, uh, uh, international crime. Uh, furthermore, we have a very strong, well, basically a checklist, very strong uh, boundaries on the type of crimes that we uh, cannot work at. So if there's a crime that has a, clearly a political component, where somebody might be persecuted because of their uh, political views, or if, it's, if there's uh, certain types of... Um, uh, let's say, if it's a racial uh, thing that's, that's been pursued by some police agency in the world or military, uh, then we cannot get involved, we just can't, it's, it's not possible for us. Which is a good thing, because that means uh, that because of that, we can provide a very neutral platform in which there is a lot of trust between the police organizations on the bits and pieces that we can work with. Uh, furthermore, one thing that I always should mention is uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations. We are an international organization and we have incorporated the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights into our constitution. And that has very strong repercussions for, for example, uh, our privacy regime. We have to always take into account the privacy of any person who is a, a subject in, in a matter of an international police uh, operation. All right, um, let's talk a little bit about the history. Why is there an Interpol? Why would it be necessary? Well, this is a border. 
uh, the border between Portugal and Spain. And for many millennia, probably, whenever there was a state and there was a local police, you know, the Weltwachter would, uh, local police would just be able to basically hit uh, any criminal that was working in their area, just hit them with a stick and they will stop committing crime. That's how it used to be until maybe a few hundred years ago when the borders started to uh, become more uh, transparent, I would say. Uh, but then still, if there is a criminal in the border between Portugal and Spain, and you know, he's stolen, I don't know, a wallet and he runs to Spain from Portugal, uh, then obviously the, the Portuguese police might not directly be able to run to Spain to follow them, but obviously they would know uh, cops in Spain who could, who could help out. This changed with the advance of new technology. And with new, I mean this kind of new technology. When, when this emerged on the world, it, it provided a lot of opportunities for people, decent people, even police, uh, but also for criminals, of course. Because for criminals, international criminals, it became much more easy to uh, communicate and also to travel, to transport whatever illegal things they might be transporting. Uh, so in 1914, the first International Criminal Police Conference was held by uh, some uh, police commissioners. It was held in Monaco, and they decided that there should be an international police organization to work together to combat this international organized crime. It was 1914, I mentioned that, and Europe was a little bit preoccupied, so it lasted until 1923 to have such an organization. Then, about one decade later, Europe became more preoccupied with other things uh, and bad things happened. Uh, and actually, that organization fell prey to Nazi Germany and was disbanded before the end of the Second World War. And then in 1946, Belgium said, wait a minute, didn't we have something like an international cooperation body? Shouldn't we have that again? And in Europe, a lot of countries said, yes, that would be a good idea. And France said, well, we didn't completely lose the war, uh, so we would like to host it. Uh, and in 1956, it was, uh, uh, it was officially named the uh, ICPO, International Criminal Police Organization, but also, if you speak French, Organisation Internationale des Police Criminelles, I guess. That's why it's also OIPC. And then there is the name Interpol. The name Interpol actually comes from the use of communications technology advanced communications technology, namely this type of uh, technology, the telegraph, which was the means, the, the default means of communication internationally when it comes to uh, uh, written communication that has to be speedy at that time. And basically, like on Twitter and Instagram, you would need a handle, you would need to have some kind of address. And uh, someone, some authority said, well, let's just take international criminal police organization and call it Interpol. And the rest is kind of history. Because it's a name that kind of stuck, uh, people liked it. Uh, it was used in books, in movies. And then one day, the organization said, oh, well, what the hell, let's, let's add a third name. So now we have three names, OIPC, ICPO, and Interpol. And uh, that's, that's how that came to be. Um, oh, yes. And also, to debunk a myth, we're not spies. I already explained that we are communicating a lot. Uh, there's, whenever it's political or military, we cannot be involved. So. We're also not spies. We just there's not so many of us. We're about 900 staff worldwide, so you don't hear about us that often. And of course, uh, what also works into that is that we work mostly for police organizations and not directly for the general public. Okay, so what do we do? What do we have? Uh, well, we provide communications. I explained that. I will give some examples. Uh, we have uh, a number of databases, about two dozen, that are shared by law enforcement across the globe. We provide training, which is uh, quite important, uh, not just to get other countries up to speed for their sake, but also for the sake of the other countries. You can imagine when it comes to cybercrime, if there's a cybercrime committed where there's victims in the Netherlands, uh, but the criminal is maybe in Bangladesh, it would be nice if the Bangladesh police would know anything uh, or something that, that could help uh, with this investigation. So that's why training is important. Um, and also we provide a lot of operational support by bringing together different law enforcement organizations uh, to, to combat specific instances of crime. And I will explain later on, uh, give some examples of some uh, more technical things that we were able to pull off. So if you look at the communications, um, one famous way of communicating is the red notice. You don't want to have one against you because you will not be able to travel without being arrested and probably deported to the country that issued it against you. Uh, and it's not just for drug criminals or internationally sought murderers or something. Actually, uh, 
a very nice example, the, the, the Netherlands High Tech Crime Unit at one day found uh, a cyber criminal that was very active, who was actually from Armenia, and he was traveling the world, he was a DJ, and by using the Interpol Red Notice, they were able to uh, get him caught and then deported back to Armenia, where they were very happy because they just had this new anti-cybercrime law, so he was actually their official first cyber criminal, and they gave him four years' detention. We have notices in many colors. It really depends on the use. Uh, it can be about uh, pe people who, who we're uh, trying to find, people who we're, we're trying to warn against, um, but it can also be more specific about a modus operandi. We basically run out of colors, uh, so I think the, the most recent, uh, recent notice that we added is the silver notice, uh, but one that is qu quite interesting for cyber is actually the purple notice. Purple notice warns police, uh, other police bodies about a new modus operandi, and it can be a, a, a cyber modus operandi, and what we try to do more and more is to see whether this would be of interest to the general audience, and if so, we will also publish that. So actually, on our website, you can just find some uh, purple notices that, that you are free to, to read and to use. The, the databases. Uh, one database that is quite famous is the Stolen and Lost Travel Document Database. If you ever lose your passport, you know that you have to go to either the police or in the Netherlands quite often to the Stadthuis, City Hall, and uh, just file a report that you've lost your passport. And the problem is that, that sometimes people, you know, later on find the passport back, they find it, retrieve it, it's hidden on, in a drawer under their underwear or something, uh, and then they don't think much about it, and then maybe a few months later they go on a holiday, and then they are stopped at customs because, or immigration uh, rather, uh, uh, because their passport is still considered to be lost. And you might be someone who looks very much like the person in your passport, but you might not be it because you might be using it fraudulently. One other database uh, is uh, what we call the, um, well, it's, it's the worst of the worst list. Um, what it contains is only hash values, hash values that are calculated over child abuse images that are uh, found across the world and where basically all the countries agreed that, you know, our, our ways of looking at things might be different, but we all agreed that this is, this is illegal material. And th the good thing about having such a database is that you can thereby automate, when you have a sex offender's hard drive, you can automate the search for images on the hard drive, which speeds up things, makes it very efficient, and also you can lower the psychological impact on, of course, the uh, detectives who have to check out these, these images. When it comes to training, cyber training, um, well, uh, we, we've developed a, a training to teach law enforcement how to work with bitcoins, how to understand the ledger, how to trace uh, payments, so follow the money over bitcoin. Um, and together with TNO, actually, we also devised a training on how to uh, investigate dark markets. And obviously, you always have to bring a torch. Uh, besides that, operational support, I will give some examples of that, uh, where we bring together uh, law enforcement in the world to work together uh, to, to fight a uh, specific instance of a crime, which can be actually one big crime or it could be a criminal phenomenon. And I will give some examples of that. Okay, so why is that all housed in, when it comes to cyber, why is that housed in a building in Singapore? Well. Why it's in Singapore is that Singapore said, you know, we like Interpol, we will give you a building. So that was quite nice. Um, but why do you need this new type of department? Why, why do you need a specific directorate against cybercrime? Well, again, new technology. And, uh, well, let's say, unfortunately, sometimes it still looks a little bit like this. Uh, if, if you have this setup running, I would say that you're either an idiot or old, uh, or the Dutch government. <coughs> but <laughs> if it looks something like this in your place, then, then to us it looks like it actually look like, looks like this, because obviously you will be hacked and your machine already has fallen prey to, to cyber criminals. And in reality, you know, these old monitors and these old boxes, it's a little bit an old fashioned way of looking at things. Of course, it looks more like uh, this nowadays. We just have one big happy cloud with which anything is connected. 
Um, I'm always looking for the pacemaker, but I don't think it's up there. We, we had an American vice president at some point who had a pacemaker with a Wi-Fi connection in it where they uh, fortunately disabled the Wi-Fi because they thought that might not, be, might not be a good idea. But everything is connected nowadays. Um, and as I explained before, the, the problem for police is that police cannot look at it this way. If there is a device that is, you know, in one country and it's connected through another country and uh, it's hacked from yet another country, then you still have this old model. You still have all these different police agencies who basically operate within their own borders. And yes, they can cooperate to a certain extent, but it's all very slow and a very complicated uh, situation. So what you rather want is something like uh, this, I would say. So like a kind of global standardized approach where at least you have some um, a standard way of looking at crimes and maybe also combating them, maybe even having a global cyber... No, that's not a good idea. Let's, let's, no, let's not go there. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, no, the, the thing is, of course, that, that countries differ so vastly in, in what they consider to be a cyber crime and also how to, how to uh, do the investigation against cyber crime that, yes, Interpol can bring the countries together, but when you want to have a clear view of what are the cyber threats, what are the digital crimes that are taking place, you need to work with the private sector. And I think a very good example is, it, uh, is that, you know, I, I mentioned some of the, um, the tech companies that we're working with. Um, a company like Kaspersky or Trend Micro would be very happy to share uh, certain threat information that they see for the Netherlands with the Dutch police. But as soon as the IP address is, you know, one centimeter over the border in Belgium or Germany, the Dutch police will never hear about it, which is fair enough, probably a good idea. Um, but they are willing to share it with Interpol, and therefore Interpol is basically the only law enforcement uh, aligned organization, you could say, that gets to see the full picture. And thereby we will be able to, uh, and we are able to make, make cross matches between different threats to different countries that we see and then inform them about it. So I'm going to talk about our three departments. We have the Cyber Fusion Center, where we kind of bring information together to create actionable information. Uh, we have the Digital Forensics Laboratory, where, well, we do more hands-on work. We tear apart malware. We also look into mobile phones. Of course, always after there's already a clear suspicion of a crime, obviously. Um, and we have the Digital Crime Center, which actually provides the operational support to operations. So let's first look into the uh, Cyber Fusion Center. It's defined as a secure and neutral collaboration workspace to, well, that's a long sentence. Uh, basically, it is an input, do things, output situation. So these are our inputs. We get information from the 190 member countries, but also from industry bodies, from the private sector, uh, from open source. And then people in the Cyber Fusion Center they could be law enforcement, they can be Interpol, uh, they can be private sector. They work together to fuse that information, to enrich it, to cross-validate it. It looks a little bit like this. What's very important uh, is, of course, to see if, if the information that we got, if, if, it's, if it's valid. So if there's another source, maybe, that can corroborate the information that you have. Um, it's also important to know if if it's a type of, if it relates, for example, to a crime that some law enforcement agency is already investigating, because if that does and we are going to go step in there, then we might actually ruin their investigation. That would be a bad thing. And very important is that we always respect the handling conditions that are put on all the information. So a country or even a company can say, you know, we will give you this information, please make the best of it, but please don't share it with Belgium, don't share with Belgium. They are our neighbors, we don't like how they talk about us. And then we will, well, we will not do that. Uh, so this is the, the fusion bit, uh, and of course there's also a model about, well, what, what kind of looks the, what does the output look like? Uh, basically, um, sometimes we have, we have public notices, I explained about the purple notices, but ge generally we uh, provide our information to um, law enforcement only. We do that through the different law enforcement channels that we have, and we provide them with either notices or uh, lists of individuals that we are, are sure are committing certain types of crimes at this moment. Um, but also it can be, again, the new uh, uh, the threat information. A good example would be lists of your vital infrastructure that seem to have been hacked. Maybe you want to look into that. And from that, countries tend to come back to us and say, please, can you tell us more? So then we can uh, set up an operation sometimes. 
Now, of course, I, I don't know all of, your, all of your backgrounds, but you might be thinking after hearing all this so far, wait a minute, um, I know something that might be of interest to Interpol. Maybe, maybe you have developed something, maybe you have a, you're a startup and you have some interesting cyber threat information, or maybe your neighbor is a cyber criminal, I don't know. Anything you'd like to share? Uh, we have this email address because the Cyber Fusion Center is also our standard intake uh, place. That's where everything very safely, securely gets, uh, gets processed. So please feel free to drop us an email. Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, one question about the Cyber Fusion Center we get often is uh, how can you work with private industry and also protect people's information? Well, we do it with, for example, this screen. So Mr. Shintaro back there is uh, he's actually working on some cyber threat information, uh, but we can easily close the window if we're working on something that contains people's personal data, for example, that he would not be allowed or willing to see. And this, of course, this is a visualization uh, of our network setup, which incorporates the same philosophy. So we have separate closed-off networks that only Interpol can access, for example, sometimes with uh, uh, law enforcement input, but it's always controlled by Interpol. Uh, the private sector would not be able to get into that. And actually, there is uh, specific laws in Singapore that have been adopted to allow for the Interpol Global Complex for Innovation and also its networks to be completely intangible to even the Singapore police. So they would not be able to come in or commit any uh, intelligence against it. Okay, so let's have a look at the digital forensics support team. Um, they do a lot of cool things, but it can be as simple as this. This is just a very straightforward uh, example. Uh, let's go to Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzia in, uh, in Dutch, uh, where uh, unfortunately a murder, murder had taken place. And well, what happened was that a body was found of a girl in a graveyard. And about 12 days later, they found a mobile phone that was probably hers, and that might, uh, might contain vital information. But they knew, you know, we're Kyrgyzstan, we're mostly a rural country, we don't have any means to, to uh, really forensically look into, into this phone and possibly find tracks that, that, that are on the traces that might, might be on the phone. Uh, so what we did very easily, uh, well, there was this company that said, okay, we have a good tool for you, we're, we're, we're willing to donate it, if Interpol would bring it to them and also support them, uh, help them out in um, uh, well, performing the investigation on this specific mobile phone. And actually, using this tool, they were able to find some deleted information that provided some contact details um, that then helped further it with the investigation of this specific crime. Very small example, but very beneficial and very f uh, rewarding, I would say, for, for uh, all people involved who are investigating this, because you're actually able to make some additional steps towards solving this crime. OK, the Digital Crime Center, which provides the uh, operational support. We basically do that in one of two flavors. One is the original Interpol model, where basically you support police-to-police -police cooperation. So you bring police forces together. I will show you some examples of that. Uh, but also now working with the private sector, private industry, uh, we have what we call the uh, cyber threat task forces, where we bring, based on, a, on subjects, I will give some examples, uh, based on subjects, we, will, we bring together information, we bring together partners, police, um, the private sector, academia, to together combat the, the crime type that that we are looking into. So just two examples of police-to-police -police cooperation. You might have heard about the Bangladesh bank heist, where, um, well, some cyber criminals, they hacked into the central bank of Bangladesh. They tried to steal a billion dollars. They made a typo, so they only got away with $81 million, which to me still is a lot of money. Uh, and then they said to Interpol, please, can you help us? And yes, so some colleagues of mine actually went down to Bangladesh. Uh, they also hooked them up to some other law enforcement agencies, and we're slowly making some progress on that. And the reason why I can tell you this is that somehow the Bangladesh police found it necessary to issue a press release about it. So, okay, it's in the public domain now. Otherwise, I wouldn't have disclosed this here. This I read on uh, new.nl this week, actually. Uh, there's been a, a kind of an attack at uh, Japanese uh, ATMs where they stole 11 million euros. I, I don't think they stole euros, they probably stole yen, probably a lot of yen. Uh, but, uh, and it was based on, on uh, stolen credit card details and they were supposedly stolen from South Africa. Now, Japan and South Africa are not very close to each other, so that's a situation where Interpol can also help and, and step in. 
Now let's look at some examples of working together with the private sector. And a good example would be Operation Strikeback, which is aimed at sextortion. Is that a term? Do you guys know what sextortion is? Uh, sometimes I'm in a country presenting where I call it indecent blackmail because the name sextortion is a bit harsh and it kind of assumes that there's also a thing like decent blackmail, you know, so please give me your money, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but so it, it's very easy, sextortion, 99% uh, of the victims are, are male actually. It's just, you know, you're sitting behind your computer, uh, you're updating your Facebook account, and you get a nice message from a nice lady, generally speaking, who chats you up, wants to know more of you, and also wants to see you naked. And a lot of men actually do that. And as soon as they do this, then they get blackmailed. Now, this might sound silly, but it's a serious problem. It's been a growing problem for a number of years, uh, and it's actually gone to the point where people have committed suicide over this because they, could not f they were too fearful of what would happen if, uh, well, this, these naked pictures uh, got out. An operation we did, it's one of the first operations we did from the Interpol Digital Crime Center. Uh, we organized it uh, with the private industry, um, but also with a, d a different set of countries. Even before the whole building was, was open yet, uh, just because it was a pressing, a pressing thing. And I, I mentioned the, uh, the suicide, with, which happened in Scotland, actually. It was a 17-year-old guy who was kind of forced to, well, they basically said, you, you can pay us or you can kill yourself. And unfortunately, uh, he felt so pressured that he did commit suicide. This is when we were already setting up this, this um, investigation, this project, we were, we were starting it up. This happened and then the Scottish police came into this collaboration that we already were setting up with, uh, well, between Hong Kong, the Philippines, uh, United States, uh, but you also see some companies there. Facebook is uh, listed there. Microsoft doesn't want to be listed, but let's say that some things get, went down through Skype, so I can imagine that they, uh, they were involved. Um, the good thing in this was that we were actually able to track down the criminals behind this. And what was, for me it was very flabbergasting was that it turned out to be an entire village in the Philippines where 50, well more than 58 people actually, 58 adults were working together, but there was also minors involved. They, had, they actually had minors chatting with the people abroad, which is very much of a, let's say, mindfuck. Uh, because that means that, that people are inadvertently having a sexual conversation with a minor who pretends to be a adult, uh, nice-looking lady, and who is just trained to you know, string you along until you undress yourself, which is very crazy. Um, unfortunately, we were able to, to step in there together with the Philippines police. Again, every, everything that I say that Interpol does things, we, do, we really bring together parties uh, in this case, and then uh, it's always the, the local law enforcement agency, the local body that, uh, that, that in the end enforces things, of course. Uh, so we're able to, to fi find 58 suspects, and in the end, uh, currently, one, is, one of them is nominated to be extradited to Scotland because he's the ringleader and he hopefully will stand trial in Scotland, and we will see what happens there. Another example are the airline action days. This is a very long sentence. Let's just look at the, uh, <laughs> uh, what it's about. It's a cooperation between many countries, many airlines, uh, many airports, and it's coordinated by not just Interpol, but also such bodies as Europol, which is in The Hague, uh, and Ameripol, which I believe is in Buenos Aires. And what is this about? It's kind of cyber-related. Um, it has to do with the fact that more and more people are booking flights by using fraudulently obtained credit card details. So they can be either forged or faked or stolen. Mostly they tend to be stolen. And the idea is that, that people are not just, you know, one-off uh, uh, stealing a credit card data and then, then booking a flight. No, there's a whole pattern behind it. They have a good reason to do so most oftenly. So they would... Um, uh, for example, be uh, involved in uh, human trafficking or drug smuggling or something else. And whenever you arrest someone like that, you f tend to find a whole criminal network that is related to that. So what we're doing is on a kind of irregular basis, a few times per year, we plan out, we carve out a few days, uh, and, we, and we look together with um, the... Um, credit card companies and the IATA, who is the uh, international body for uh, the, the airline business, and also their two uh, fraud detection agencies, Perseus and CyberSource. 
and they are uh, quite good at finding an indication of, okay, this is a fraudulent transaction, this is dodgy, here's something going on. And uh, they we're able to compile lists, and of course, when the days approach, you, you try to uh, make the hunches and the indications uh, stronger and stronger, so that you only target the individuals that are coming to the airport that are really, you know, doing something really wrong there, and then they get, oh, yep, and then they get stopped. And yeah, this, this slide, is, I think it's a year old. We were very happy then that we had a shared form with uh, EC3 and Ameripol. Fortunately, nowadays, we have a shared system, so that makes it a little bit uh, smoother. And just to give you an idea, uh, this is, these are operations that go down a few times per year. They will take roughly between 36 and 48 hours. And we, well, law enforcement in the different countries will arrest between 100 and 200 people and then find means to further investigate because nine out of 10 times there are whole criminal networks behind that. So it gives you a very good starting point to first of all, stop this type of crime, but also, uh, uh, well, continue and, and uh, look further into organized crime that is making use of these, these, uh, these fraudulently obtained tickets. Okay, this is how uh, the coordination of an operation could look like. I, I took this picture in the Cyber Fusion Center, actually. Uh, and the final, final operation that I'm going to talk about is the Simda botnet takedown. This went down also in the Cyber Fusion Center uh, about uh, a little bit over a year ago. And uh, it was a cooperation between, well, Interpol coordinated it. The Netherlands played a key role, Poland, Luxembourg, Russia, the United States, and all of these tech companies. Now, why were these... Um, why were these countries involved? That has to do with the fact, uh, well, how a botnet is, is organized. You have different types of botnets, but this was more of a uh, star network shaped uh, kind of botnet where uh, you basically have your command and control server set up in different countries and infected machines try to contact the command and control server and ask them, okay, what, what should I do? Uh, should I uh, DDoS someone? Should I steal this person's credentials? Something like that. And th the main command and control servers for this specific botnet were located in these countries, uh, most notably four of them in the Netherlands, actually. Oh, yeah. The victims were uh, all over the world. So the impact of the takedown was also a worldwide thing. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's a lot of countries uh, being helped out there. All right. Um, so the Simna botnet, uh, the, the purpose of the botnet seemed to be mostly actually to infect machines and then resell them, rent them out to other criminals. So they were very good at, at infecting machines and then, um, uh, well, making sure it wasn't detected or it was very hard to detect the infection. And then from that, maybe sometimes even remove the, the malware and uh, rent out the, bo the, 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 the machines that were, that were infected to other criminals for whatever purpose they might have. And the purpose might be, of course, worse. It was quite nice that this happened actually a few days before the opening of our building. It coincided with that, but some people who were working in the building, you know, the Secretary General of Interpol was opening the building and announcing this, and then the news basically said, oh, they took down a botnet. And, oh, by the way, they also have a new building. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, the, uh, one of the uh, interesting bits when you look at the, at the victims, which we were able to distinguish, uh, was where are the victims located? So this is the EMEA reg region, which is Europe, Middle East, uh, uh, let's say Africa. Um, and an important thing to notice is that the Netherlands are, is not on this list, just not there. And you can imagine that it can sometimes be difficult to then convince a law enforcement agency uh, to, to put resources into such a takedown. Because if you don't have any victims, or hardly any victims, why would you do so? For the US, uh, the US it was a little bit uh, easier, because, well, they had, they had some more uh, victims. Um, and uh, one, one way Interpol can help out here is by clarifying how the infrastructure of such a botnet works, and the fact that... Um, well, for example, a lot of victims for uh, CNCs that were in Russia, a lot of those victims were in the US and vice versa. So you can imagine that if um, the United States says, wait a minute, we have all these victims here and they are uh, victims and they are controlled, these machines, from, from Moscow. Please, Moscow, can you take down this botnet for us that maybe the phone wouldn't even be picked up? on the other side, and you need a very coordinated takedown in this uh, matter. I will explain about that. Let's, let's first look a little bit at, at how so many computers were 
uh, compromised, 770,000, I said, and that those were only the ones that we were able to free in the end. In between, there might have been many more computers that were then resold to other criminals um, and from which the, the SIMDA botnet had actually been removed. So there's many ways of compromising machines. Uh, you can do it through SQL injections, uh, spam emails, uh, well, uh, all kinds of social, social engineering attacks. And these guys, they were really specialists because they just used all of these techniques. The, the impact, um, well, as I already explained, um, you basically your machine, if you were, if you were compromised by the SIMDA botnet, uh, your machine would be part of a slave market. They will be able to, to resell uh, the credentials to your machine. But then also in the standard SIMDA approach, uh, they could easily steal your identity, uh, look what you were doing, uh, commit some uh, Bitcoin mining, where they basically use your resources to, to create Bitcoin, so they make money of your machine, commit click fraud against Google, um, and actually even divert some of your internet traffic. And just, just the bits that they wanted to, so that's kind of scary that most of it was, you know, regular internet traffic, but then you go to Facebook and then, oh, something else happens, and what happens, that's scary. This is a little bit about the worldwide impact. I think I covered that already. Um, most importantly, it was designed in a way where if the, the, the slaves, the bots, would not be able to connect to a specific IP address, uh, to a specific server, maybe the one in Moscow would have been taken down, they would just try to connect to another part of the world. So they would try to connect to Washington and then to the, somewhere in the Netherlands, which makes it very um, necessary at that point, of course, to have a simultaneous takedown, because otherwise you just lose the fight. Finally, the malware itself, um, I think I already explained a little bit, it was very hard to analyze. If you, we looked at it in the digital forensics lab, the guys there have great software for that. They have these sandboxes in which you can inject the, the malware and then see what it does. Uh, but the sandboxes would freeze up or you would only see a nice looking calculator. So it would actually be able to detect that it was being investigated. Um, because a lot of infections were, were followed by removing SIMDA and then reselling your uh, machine to another criminal. It was quite hard to measure what was the exact impact, of course. Um, and one final thing that made it difficult, but also to some extent helped us, was that the individual bots, the slaves, the, the zombies, uh, they all try to connect to IP addresses. And this is a little bit archaic. If you know anything about botnets, you know that nowadays mostly they try to connect to a, uh, a, a generated domain. So that can be, uh, well, uh, sometimes automatically generated based on certain parameters. And if that happens, if you were able to distinguish the uh, parameters of generating that domain name, you could actually preemptively register it. Or uh, if it's just a domain name that, has already, that already is in existence, uh, law enforcement can easily take that down. With a hard-coded IP address, it's a little bit more complicated because they have a geolocation. There's just some machine somewhere located in a building where you have to go to that building and then find that machine and unplug it, which, which also makes it quite easy to take down the botnet if you are law enforcement and you have the resources and you coordinate well because you just have to go to the geolocation, go to the building, go to the machine and unplug it. So that's what we did. It looked a little bit like this. Uh, we had a simultaneous takedown where I actually have to say that uh, the, 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 the Russians were, were perfectly on time. Everybody else, including my home country, they had, you know, in the Netherlands we had four servers in different locations, so it was a little bit, uh, took a little bit more time. Um, but, but it's a very nice way of, of showing that police cooperation can actually be achieved and can also be successful. And for me personally, it's not just a police cooperation success, it's also success in public-private partnerships. Because the companies that we were working with, they each played their role, they each uh, solved a little bit of the puzzle, and actually we had the specialists uh, of those countries, uh, of the, those companies, uh, uh, sitting actually together in our, in our collaboration room, working together, and um, actually coming up with solutions to each other's problems. And that is kind of how you want the world to be, right? That's, that's one of the nice things about it. Well, let's talk finally a little bit about pri uh, private and, and, and public cooperation. Because I think it made it, quite, made it quite obvious that for Interpol and also for law enforcement internationally, when it comes to cybercrime, 
Yes, uh, we really like to work with the private industry because they hold the data that we need to be able to do our work. But what is in it for them? Why would any private corporation work with us? Well, um, I, I do believe that they are really interested in helping doing those kind of takedowns. The, the, all the companies that we're working with, they've been thoroughly vetted. There are uh, clear due diligence uh, processes, uh, and they are really adamant that they want to help us in fighting, fighting cybercrime and, and digital threats. On the other hand, of course, it doesn't hurt if you have these press releases and your company is mentioned in that press release. Also, before I mention, well, for example, this company, I'm not paid by them, I, I don't have anything to do with them, but, you know, I just told you the case about Kyrgyzstan, and it's a nice thing, it's nice profiling for them. Also, they've got uh, a showcase in Kyrgyzstan, but people in Kyrgyzstan might not have ever heard of them, and now they are opening a little bit of their market there. So that's good for them. When you look at it more from an academic uh, perspective, um, we're also to able to provide research opportunities. Uh, for example, this is something that went down uh, last year. We had a researcher from a private company working together with an Interpol researcher who was able to provide him with some law enforcement data, and together they found out that in, the, um, in this case, the, the, the protocol of uh, the current Bitcoin protocol, there are some, well, flaws, you could say. So it's not something against the whole idea of a blockchain, but the current implementation of, of Bitcoin allows for the injection of a lot of uh, problematic things. And it's not just the fact that we're able to research that together, but also that you then get a, can get a platform at, for example, the Black Hat Conference. I also mentioned TNO, uh, which is a, a Dutch institution uh, that exists, well, partly to make practical application out of uh, things that happen in science. And, for example, the, the scientific knowledge that they have about uh, Bitcoin and about dark uh, markets, for example, um, for them to convert that into information that law enforcement worldwide can handle and also to provide training that, that adds enough value for all law enforcement to then uh, take part in such a training, well, that's something where Interpol can, can intermediate. And actually, on this picture is uh, Professor Peter Hartel, who uh, you might have heard of him. He's a famous Dutch uh, cybersecurity researcher. And he actually worked in the Interpol Global Complex for Innovation for about six months uh, to develop this kind of training. So finally, uh, well, this is, this is uh, a picture of Singapore. Uh, this is the CBD, the Central Business, business District, or uh, you could say they're uh, Zuidas. Uh, and there's all these, you know, all these companies, all these banks sitting in their, in their own towers, and sometimes they're not even allowed to, to really talk with each other on a business level because of uh, market laws, uh, but they are allowed to send someone to our little building, uh, well, it's not that little actually, <laughs> uh, but to our building, and to their work together against these cyber threats that they are all facing. Now, finally, if you, if you ever happen to find yourself in Singapore, um, if you look at the R, I'm kind of my, my desk is basically under the R. Uh, so feel free to wave at me or uh, maybe, maybe drop me a line, if you like. Uh, and also, again, if you have something to, to share with us uh, or if you have questions, I have some time now. I will be available after this presentation. Or you could just drop us a line at cfc at interpol.int. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you. All right. One more time for Roland Van Zeist, please. Give it up nice and loud. See, I like you. this. You've got like the best, you've got the best hand claps. <laughs> so I want you all to sit tight. Roland is going to come off stage and answer some questions with you all. And at 6 p.m., we're getting started with the business pitch finale, as well as the award ceremony that will follow it. So stay put, stay here at the main stage. There's a lot more coming up. And thank you for your energy and your very loud claps. We'll see you all soon.